Creative Babble. All right, so I'm working on the next season of Pretend, and I have almost all the interviews recorded, so I'm putting them all together, and it's going to be a collection of different types of cons and scams, cons that you can't even imagine are real. I mean, these are stories that come out of left field, and I'm working with my friend Michelle Kahn, who is the white hat that you heard in the Stalker series, and we are working on an investigation that could turn out to be fruitful. I mean... Wait till you see what we found out. I'm just going to leave it there because this could have a huge impact. So yeah, I have a lot of stuff cooking and I need a little bit of time to put things together. So I started thinking, what episode in the back catalog would be really nice to play for some of our new listeners or some listeners who have maybe listened to it but haven't heard it in a long time? And then... I thought of the Treasure Hunter series because it is actually one of my favorite series. It has adventures. It has con on con action. <laughs> it's everything you want in a story. And it's one of the, my favorite rabbit holes that I've gone down. And I think you're going to enjoy it. Now, there were four episodes in the series. So I'm only going to play for you the first episode, but if you want to listen to it and revisit the Treasure Hunter series, you can find it in season six of Pretend. I will actually link to those episodes in the show notes so that you could continue to listen. I don't usually listen to my show, but whenever I rerun an episode, I want to make sure that I enjoyed it and I listened to it on my walk today. And man, it is, this is it. This is as good as it gets. At least I think it is. Anyway, let's play the episode for you. This is The Treasure Hunter, Part 1. If you've spent any time in Tampa, Florida, you know that they have a culture for celebrating pirates. Every year since 1904, a pirate ship, along with a fleet of hundreds of other boats, sail into downtown Tampa and demand that the mayor hand over the keys to the city. Soon after, thousands of people rush to the streets, donning cheap plastic beads and guzzling down Bloody Marys. This display of merriment and good times is known as the Gasparilla Pirate Festival, which has become the third largest parade in the U.S. Trust me, I went to college in Tampa, so I'm no stranger to this swashbuckling tradition. Go Bulls! My name is Christopher Spada, and I'm a culture reporter at the Tampa Bay Times. I definitely am drawn to sort of the offbeat stories, and we have a lot of those here in Florida. We all know Florida is a strange place, and that's exactly Chris Spada's beat. So it's no surprise that when a story about an alleged treasure hunter slash con artist landed on his lap, he had to dig in. So this one caught my attention. It was a pretty strange story. Yeah. How did you discover it? We have a service that kind of reviews all the, the lawsuits that come through the Hillsborough County Courthouse in Tampa. Here's all the lawsuits that have come through in the past few days and a little summary of them. It didn't say much, but kind of in the headline, I saw treasure hunter, the words treasure hunter which for me, anytime I see the words treasure hunter, I kind of perk up. Here's the gist. There's a treasure salvage company based in Tampa, Florida. It's called Seafarer Exploration. And their mission is to find a 300-year-old Spanish galleon sunken off the coast of Florida. A galleon, if you can imagine, is a big-ass sailboat with multiple decks, three or four masts, and are designed to carry large treasures found in the New World and bring it back to Spain. And this company, Seafarer Exploration, is not just looking for any Spanish galleon. The company believes that they have located the wreckage of the 1715 Spanish fleet, La Santísima Trinidad y Nuestra Señora de la Concepción. We'll just call it La Concepción. So back in 1715, the Spanish fleet loaded up with silver departed from Havana, Cuba. Seven days later, just off of the east coast of central Florida, a hurricane swooped in and took down 11 of the 12 ships, including La Concepcion. Hence the reason why they call this part of Florida the Treasure Coast. But as you can imagine, trying to find the mother load buried underneath the ocean is like finding a needle in a haystack. 
If seafair exploration has any chance in finding this treasure, they're going to need to find someone who could build them a ship that is powerful enough to scan the ocean floor. Imagine a giant floating metal detector that can capture high-resolution images of the seabed. A ship that can tell the difference between silver and gold. That's when Kyle Kennedy, CEO of Seafair Exploration, was introduced to a man who said, sure, I could build you this machine. His name is Dr. Michael Torres. Kyle Kennedy claims that Michael Torres presented himself as an aeronautical engineer who graduated with a doctorate's degree from Duke University. Torres also said he taught at MIT Draper Labs and represented the NSA while also working on multiple classified government contracts. Kyle Kennedy couldn't believe it. This Dr. Michael Torres guy was perfect. And on top of his unbelievable resume, Kennedy says that Dr. Torres claims he was a war hero who served two tours in Afghanistan. He says he was even awarded the Purple Heart Medal, which is a top honor for members of the Army or Air Force who have been wounded or killed in combat. Fast forward a few years later, Kyle Kennedy is now suing Michael Torres for fraud. He says he's a con artist who faked his credentials. The publicly traded company Seafair Exploration filed a lawsuit demanding Torres to repay more than $100,000 in wages, plus 61 million shares of the company's stock. So who is this guy? Dr. Michael Torres? I'm going to track him down and find out if he really is who they say he is. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. So I've been talking a lot about my new favorite mobile app game called June's Journey, where you're trying to figure out June's sister's murder, almost like a detective. You're an amateur detective, and the whole thing takes place in the glamorous, roaring 20s. What I love about this game is that real life is so overstimulating, and we got emails, social media notifications, work stuff, everything is just noise. But when I play this game, I am lost in a whole different time period. And it just feels so great to just escape for a little while. The point of the game is that you have to find hidden objects and clues. There's scenes of parlors in New York or sidewalks in Paris. It's really beautifully done if you haven't seen it. I personally love the story part of the game because you're not just playing a game to pass time. Every single action is driving the story forward, and that's what I love about it. It really is truly an immersive game that you can play at any time. Whoever put these games together is really, they're artists, they're great storytellers, and I think you're going to love it. So see if you could crack the case. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. When Chris Botta from the Tampa Bay Times contacted Kyle Kennedy to talk about the story, he was immediately shut down. The thing about getting in touch with Kyle Kennedy, who's the CEO of, of Seafair, which is the treasure salvage company that is suing Mike Torres, is that he really did not want to talk to me at all about this story. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think with good reason, it, it, he looks kind of foolish. Here you have a guy who made some pretty outrageous claims and you hired him and it, it comes through kind of obviously that he didn't, they didn't vet this guy when they hired him for this pretty serious job. And even though it's a lawsuit and it's public record and anyone can look it up right now online in about five minutes, I think they would have really preferred that it didn't end up in the news. Let's dive into it. No more puns, I promise. Sure. <laughs> so who, who is the, Dr. Michael Torres from your perspective and from your reporting? Yeah, he's, he's a guy in his mid-30s who we don't know a ton about his life other than we know that in 2018, 
this company, Seafarer Exploration, announced that they had hired Dr. Michael Torres and presented him basically as this brilliant, wounded warrior. He received the Purple Heart two times. He had some other medals that he'd earned. He was a scientist who uh, was going to help them create this device that they're working on to scan the ocean floor for any type of material so that they could find treasure. So what they're claiming to be developing is this device that's going to let them scan the ocean floor off the coast of Florida, and it's going to identify exactly what's down there before they even have to put anyone in the water. What they announced that Michael Torres was going to be able to do because he was a brilliant a scientist was that he was going to be able to help them develop this technology to scan the ocean floor and, and make it really easy to find the gold. And you can see in their announcement that's, that's archived, they removed it from their website now. He's got extensive knowledge and experience in avionics system development and aerospace engineering. He's an adjunct professor at MIT. He's a decorated wounded war veteran with a purple heart and a bronze star, among his many other uh, citations and awards. And he's going to develop advanced technologies to find gold, silver, and whatever else is down there in the sea. This guy sounds awesome. The question you asked was, was who is he? He's a guy that we know is from South Carolina. He, he went to high school in South Carolina. I heard from some people who knew him from back then, even after the story went online. We know that at some point he went to the Citadel. The Citadel, by the way, is a military college in Charleston, South Carolina. The civil complaint against Torres claims that he never graduated from the Citadel. In fact, he flunked out with a 1.3 GPA. During that time, he was in the Air Force ROTC, and we know that in 2018, he was hired by this company, Seafair, and we know that in 2019, he was fired by this company, company Seafair, and we know that in 2020, he was sued by them for having made up all of his credentials. That's everything we know factually about him. You mentioned that, that some people who knew him from South Carolina came forward and, and talked to you. What, what did they say? I'm curious. Did they come to his defense? No, they did not. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, I want to see if I can pull up the email here that someone sent me about him. I heard from a, a couple people who knew him earlier before all this treasure hunter stuff. I had a guy who, who hit me up and he said, I went to high school in Goose Creek, South Carolina, uh, just outside of Charleston with this guy. And he hadn't heard from Mike Torres since high school. So <laughs> he said, Mike was not a con artist back then, but he began learning how to spin these enormous lies when it came to picking up the ladies. And this guy remembers after I graduated, it was said that Mike took a letter to the front office of the school and that the school made a public announcement that Mike had been accepted into West Point. Mike came by my parents' house and even showed them the letter. He says, even that letter was fabricated and the entire West Point stunt was a lie. West Point is a very prestigious military university. So even back then, he was kind of, at least according to some people who say they know him, was making up stories. So maybe it started early. So now they hire him as seafarer exploration. And what exactly does he do to fool Kennedy? So Kennedy describes it as this guy came in and impressed him so much that he was just ready to hire him uh, and, and get him to work. The guy came in and he started spouting off all these technical terms and jargon and and saying he could he could go down to the he could see the electrons and the, he could get down to the atomic level um, in, in these different elements in the way that they were going to create this device and scan the ocean floor. He basically described it as just being dazzled by this guy's brilliance. So he hired him. That's how he describes it. This is a story about an ongoing lawsuit. So you can imagine that there's a lot of bad blood between these two parties. Chris Bada says that these guys can't agree on anything. Not even the story on how they met. 
Michael Torres says that Seafair approached him. Kyle Kennedy says it was the other way around. So they have conflicting stories about who really approached who. But either way, he walks in there, he's interviewed by the CEO of the company. Kyle Kennedy described it as, man, I was blown away. This guy can spout off this stuff like like no one you've ever heard. Which is kind of funny because in the lawsuit, he says that he could probably fool most people, but you can't fool an engineer. Yeah, and we should be clear, Kyle Kennedy is not an engineer. Kyle Kennedy, he's the CEO of this company. He was a financial guy. He had a company that he specialized in taking other companies public, and he did that with a bunch of different companies, and he made some money, and about... I guess 12 years ago, he founded Seafair. But again, he's a financial guy. He's not a scientist or an archeologist or a historian. So he basically was like, well, I didn't know because I'm not an engineer. In the beginning, Seafair Exploration was blown away by Michael Torres' credentials. I mean, they really propped this guy up in front of investors and it worked. Before they hired Torres, Seafair stock was at an all-time low. Their penny stock shot up immediately after the news of his hiring. This is the Uptick Newswire Stock Day Podcast. We're talking about no other than Seafair Exploration Corp. And with us today is uh, Kyle Kennedy. He's the CEO and President and Chairman. And uh, Kyle, welcome to the show. Everett, thank you. I'm excited to be here and I'm also still very appreciative you're still a shareholder. That's (laughs) fantastic. Here's Kyle Kennedy talking about Michael Torres. This is a clip from a financial podcast a few months before Kyle Kennedy fired Michael Torres. Dr. Torres, he is a brilliant scientist, and he's helping us develop state-of-the-art technology that will allow us to look under the sand and identify gold and silver. And and he's physically building that for us right now. So when did things go south? How did Kyle Kennedy and Seafarer figure out that Michael Torres isn't who he says he is? Here's Chris Bada again with the Tampa Bay Times. This was the, this was probably my favorite detail in the whole story. So there's a big meeting and a couple different people from Seafarer described this meeting to me. So, and they all described it in the same way. There's this big meeting with the Seafarer people and with the actual real engineers who are going to help them build this, this device to scan the ocean. They all meet. And during that meeting, Mike Torres gets up and there's a whiteboard and a dry erase marker. And he starts writing out this huge equation. And he's, he's just marking up the board like crazy. And the way it was described to me is as he's marking up the board, he's like reacting as if he's having these epiphanies with his own equation that he's writing. He's going, oh, I've got it. I've got it. That's it. And then he scribbles more. And he's looking back at the people who are watching him like, are you seeing this? <laughs> the people from Seafair wouldn't know because they're not, they're not experts. They're not scientists. The other people in the room are. They waited until after the meeting. Mike Torres was not in the room. And the way it was told to me is that the actual scientists, the real engineers, turned to the people from Seafair, Kyle Kennedy, and one of his divers and said, you know, that wasn't even an equation. That was just a bunch of gibberish. <laughs> None of this makes any sense. Oh, my gosh. Um, but, yeah, I mean, who has, I mean, excuse my friends, who has the balls to go in front of a bunch of engineers and, and try to, like, you know, write a bunch of gibberish on the board and, and get away with it? That is what blew me away is it takes some real confidence and some real confidence in your abilities to fake it for you to get up there in front of people who would know and and think that you're just going to dash off this thing that's an equation and then fool them. That's amazing. Things were starting to smell kind of fishy. Not only were they starting to have doubts about this guy's credentials, some in the company started questioning everything about him, including his famous war stories. There was this night when they have a dive house near the beach where kind of all the seafarers, uh, divers can, can stay there. And Kyle Kennedy, the CEO, Mike Torres, and a couple of these divers and a pastor who had blessed one of seafarers' boats earlier that day, they're all kind of hanging out, having a drink after work. And, and it's getting late and they start having this discussion about 
war and Mike Torres kind of things kind of turned dark. And he tells him this story about how his sergeant had been captured and he had to go in and kick down the door. And the guy had a grenade in his hand. He shot this guy. Uh, and after he shot the guy, the guy started spasming. So he couldn't, he wouldn't let go of the grenade because his hand clenched up and they had to get the grenade out of the guy's hand. And he saved his sergeant and he got him away and, and he saved the day. And he's telling him these stories about having to call in an airstrike on a whole village. And like, oh, can you imagine what that feels like to have to call in an airstrike on a whole village and there's innocent people in it? And just these really intense stories about things that he did, which now we see are completely completely fabricated <laughs> the people who heard him say this stuff are like wow this is getting really dark and intense and it's actually becoming uncomfortable but you know who are we to question this this wounded veteran who's like bearing his soul to us right now they really just bought it just close your eyes for a second and for a moment try to picture dr michael torres in your head What does a guy who claims to be a brilliant engineer with a PhD from Duke and who's also a wounded war hero, who also finds all kinds of treasures, look like? I'm seeing Indiana Jones. How about you? The the funniest thing is probably when you look at the photo of him that appeared on the front page of Florida Today, which is the newspaper over near the area where this guy's from. He's wearing a fur-lined like bomber jacket, like leather bomber jacket. In Florida, which is already, <laughs> no one ever has any reason to wear a jacket like that here in Florida. Or a jacket. <laughs> yeah, you know, And he's wearing this hat that's like very Indiana Jones-esque. So, he's, he's presenting himself as such a an adventuring treasure hunter. It's the kind of guy you'd be excited to have a beer with and talk to if you believe yeah. his story, for sure. I mean, he definitely looks the part. He did some TV interviews. And in the TV interviews, he's wearing that same leather jacket and the Indiana Jones hat. But he's also, he's got the jacket open and he's wearing a brand new MIT t-shirt. Like, it looked like it just came off the, the rack. And I'm thinking, yeah, if you're an MIT, an adjunct MIT professor, of course you'd be wearing an MIT t-shirt at all times just to let everyone know that that's, <laughs> that's who you are. It seemed like so on the nose, like... If you're claiming to be an adjunct MIT professor, of course, you have to wear an MIT t-shirt. So, you managed to talk with Dr. Michael Torres. First of all, I want to know about your conversation, but is he even a doctor? Michael Torres is not a PhD. He does not hold a doctorate degree. And the surprising thing is when I got him on the phone, he admitted that immediately. And what did he say? Yeah. The weird thing was, is well, I mean, so I called him. I said, hey, uh, I'm pretty sure you're aware that you're being sued. What's what's up with that? <laughs> you know, I kind of just wanted to give him a chance to, I didn't even ask him any specific questions. I kind of just said, what's up with that? And he, I don't think I had to ask another question for the next 10 or 15 minutes because he just started going on and on. Here's his story. He says that he he is an engineer. He is a systems engineer. He is a coder. He does understand this kind of technology. He said he never told Seafair that he was a a PhD and that he never claimed that he held this this degree from, from Duke University. He said, I did graduate from the Citadel with a degree in electrical engineering. So that part is true. He said, I really was in the Air Force. And then I was a contractor working for the army. And he said, I have all the proof in the world that I can show you uh, to prove that. But I said, well, if you weren't really a a PhD, then then why did you say that? And his story is, he says, Kyle Kennedy fluffed up his his resume, added all the the stuff about his, his heroic military career added all the extra stuff about him, you know, having all these advanced degrees and having been a, an adjunct professor at MIT to make him sound better to investors uh, in Seafair. That's Michael Torres' story. And then he says, Kyle Kennedy took me around. He paraded me around at retirement communities and car shows and 
different places where he was seeking investors for Seafair. And he would introduce me as Dr. Michael Torres. And I went along with it. Hmm. And he says, I, I didn't come up with any of that stuff. I just went along with it because that's what he wanted me to do. And so I said, well, why is he suing you now then if, if that was the plan all along? And he said, well, Seafair is, a, is some sort of a, a scam. I don't know anything uh, too deep about the business of Seafair and what, what they're up to and you know, how they get investors or what they spend those investors' money on. But I do know that they, <laughs> they hired a guy who they claim told a very hard to believe story. Well, and it's interesting that he flips it around. He's like, they're the con man. I just went along with it. When I talked to Michael Torres, he was very confident and he, he had an explanation for almost everything that you ask him about. He claimed that, oh, I did work at the MIT, at the Draper Lab at MIT, but I wasn't an adjunct professor. And he had some sort of, appeared to be an email where it's like, on your first day at the Draper Lab, go and talk to such and such person. Well, I contacted the Draper Lab. I couldn't confirm or rule out anything. When we come back from the break, things are going to turn around. You're going to hear from Michael Torres himself and about a huge discovery that he found on a Florida beach that could date back thousands of years. But the question is, is it even real? Michael Torres made a huge discovery while walking on the beach. So big that it even made the local news. New tonight, a rare piece of history washing up on the beach. It's an ancient mask, but there's more than meets the eye. Laying there underneath the sand was what Michael Torres believed to be an ancient Peruvian burial mask made up of space metal. Here's Michael Torres telling news reporters about the Peruvian burial mask. It's a death mask though, right? It is, yeah. That was looted from Machu Picchu. It's about as thin as a piece of paper, but this is metal, precious metal. X-rays have revealed iridium, possibly from a meteor. Iridium is one of the rarest metals on Earth. The element can also be found in meteorites. With with, with space metal. (laughs) Literally, space metal. Here's Chris Bada again, reporter for the Tampa Bay Times. So he is already working for Seafair for several months. And in early 2019, all of a sudden, these news stories start appearing in the Central Florida TV news and also in a newspaper on Florida's East Coast. Um, He makes the front page of that newspaper, actually. And it's a photo of him holding up this Peruvian burial mask. At least that's how he described it as, as as a funeral mask. The story is that Torres found this mask on the beach after a storm buried in the sand. But my question is, why would a pre-Incan Peruvian mask be buried in the sand in Florida? That doesn't really make any sense. So his explanation for why a Peruvian burial mask was found on a beach in Florida is that it would have been on one of those ships because they were coming from South America and then it it washed up. So it's plausible. I mean, yeah, it, it seems... It, I mean, they had an explanation for it that sounded plausible. Different people have told me that, you know, a mask coming out of the water would have been in a lot worse shape than the one that you see him photographed with. Or, you know, a two-year-old digging up in the sand at the beach could have found it. But, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Yeah, what luck. What luck that the guy who's searching for treasure is in, employed by a company that's searching for treasure, happens to be the one that finds this thing on the beach. Yeah, he, he just knew where to look. So in terms of the mask, what he told me was, oh, the mask is, the mask is real. He was sticking to the story. The mask is definitely real. And I have museums that are interested in it. The Peabody Museum at Harvard is interested in displaying it. I have a professor at Harvard who has verified that it's a real mask. I have a professor at Columbia who has verified it was a real mask. He had another professor at another university who he said had verified the mask. Well, I contacted all of these professors at these. I was going to say, I was going to say, did you contact these guys? Yeah. And he had the thing that he provided to me as proof was these emails between him and those professors where the professors 
were kind of vaguely saying, yeah, that appears to be a Peruvian something. They weren't saying anything very specific. So when I get in touch with the professors, they're like, they all kind of characterize it the same way. This guy was super aggressive about trying to get us to confirm this mask. They all said, I would never confirm the authenticity of an artifact without seeing it in person. And the only thing he did was send us photographs of it. I've read the emails that Michael Torres sent these universities. Both university professors seemed intrigued by this find. They implied that if the mask were real, it could be from a pre-colonial Peru. One of the professors asked if Michael Torres could provide x-rays of the mask. Then maybe they could learn a little bit more. And they all agreed. All that they told him was the style of the artwork on this thing that you're sending us does appear to be Peruvian from this time period. None of them ever said, oh, this is, this thing is authentic. But that's kind of the way my experience went with him is he'd send you something that kind of seemed like, okay, well, he's, he's talking to this professor from Columbia about this mask and they're acknowledging Peru. And then I asked the guy at Harvard with the Peabody Museum, are you interested in displaying this mask? And he was like, first of all, we don't display anything that's not in Harvard's personal co- collection. And we never have in the existence of this museum for like over 100 years. It was preposterous that they would be interested in displaying this guy's mask. All right, my next step, I'm going to try to contact both Cal Kennedy and Torres. Yeah, and you know, he'll, again, talking to this guy on the phone made me second guess the things that I was, you know, preparing to write about him. He's right. very convincing. He will tell you a, a very good explanation for everything that was in that lawsuit and, you know, what he knows. And if you can get him, to tell you a little bit about the technology that he was developing for Seafair. You really should get him recorded explaining that, how the way that technology was going to work. All right, here we go. I have his number right in front of me. I can't even imagine if he's going to want to talk to me. After all, this is an ongoing lawsuit. but. I have to try. Hey, my name's Javier Leva. I'm a podcast producer, and I was wondering if, if this was a good time to ask you a couple questions. Yeah, yeah, fire away. Is this about the settlement? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it partly <laughs> is. That's what caught my attention, right? But you okay. you also seem like a, like a really interesting guy. I never even got a chance to ask my first question, and Michael Torres was already making all kinds of fantastical claims about treasures and historical ruins he's discovered. So we found we found the crown jewels of a pre-Incan civilization. Uh, we've, we've, we've had a stride the last two and a half years. So we found one of Sir Francis Drake's old ships. We've we found the missing settlement in what? Georgia. We recently found a mass Jewish grave behind Bonaventure, and we had to contact the FBI. It's been insane lately. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This guy just shot off like four different discoveries he found. I don't even know where to start. I heard something about Sir Francis Drake, you know, the English explorer who famously sailed around the world in a single expedition. Here's the theory. So you know they sacked St. Augustine, right? Like when he, when he was a privateer, he burned St. Augustine in the ground. We think one of his ships limped out to sea and sank. We found what they couldn't get off of it. We found coal, we found buckle. We know it was English because of the, the, the construction. The only reason the English would have been in that area as a fortified position if it was Sir Francis Drake's uh, fleet. There was a few cannon left on they couldn't get off and they were clearly English. There was also a French cannon on it, so we know it was a privateering ship. That's, that's a dead giveaway. Wow, this guy is intense. Eventually, I did ask him about the lawsuit. So what is going on with the lawsuit? So basically, it's blackmail. They want the mask. They want the mask? The one from Peru? Yeah, the Peruvian death mask. The attorney uh, the attorney that's suing me it has, a, has a history of this. This is his MO, his character assassination. His attorney is a business partner of his. He's been... He's been sanctioned by the bar. He also was caught blackmailing the Manatee County Sheriff running for office. So basically just uh, blackmail and character assassination. So he is an MO of this. At first, I thought Michael Torres was making up these accusations. So immediately after our call, I looked it up 
and it turns out that some of what he's saying adds up. Craig Huffman, the attorney for Seafair, has been accused of extortion in the past and has been reprimanded by the Florida Bar. Michael Torres also took swings at Kyle Kennedy, the CEO. So if you look up Seafair yeah. and Kyle Kennedy, he is the CEO. He's already been popped by the SEC once. And sure enough, I looked it up and Kyle Kennedy was suspended by the SEC for three months back in 2003 for violating the Securities and Exchange Act. Of course, those accusations are totally unrelated to the story. However, I just figured that this was just one of Michael Torres's tall tales. I almost dismissed it without taking it seriously. When you were first approached to, to join Seafair, what was that like? Was that exciting? Oh, or? it... It, it it was exciting. They led me to believe that they were a respected salvage company with the state of Florida and that they had uh, a track record and they were really actually out there looking for, for items of cultural significance. Turns out they were just raising money to fund their own lifestyle. It was bullshit. They've never found anything. And he's right. In its 13 years of operation, Seafair Exploration hasn't found any treasure, or at least not anything of value. So they have never found anything of significance? Nope, nothing, not a thing, not a thing. I was the only one to find anything. It's um, a publicly traded company, right? Traded company, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a penny stock. But if you, if you research them, if you actually like research them, it's a scam. And what do they want from you? They want $300,000 and they want the map. Hmm. That's interesting. And th they made some claims about you. like, Oh, yeah, they made a bunch of shit up. They, they're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Character assassination. I mean, if you don't mind, let, let's kind of go through some of them. They were saying that you flunked out of the Citadel with a 1.3 GPA. And, uh, and then they said I wasn't an engineer. They said I never worked at Draper Lab. And I have evidence of all of this. So, so, so if you they're look wrong at about Kyle, that? If you, yes, that is correct. They are very wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle doesn't like to be stood up to. So he just assumed that it was going to be like every other lawsuit he ever had, that it would just be non-contested. Well, fuck that. I'm, I'm contesting it. I have proof I worked at Draper. I still have my MIT library card. This was a lot to take in at once. I just started digging into this. I mean, I hope that this is not the last time we talk. Yeah, awesome. No problem. This was the first of many conversations I've had with Michael Torres. At one point, the calls were daily. <laughs> and sometimes they were several times a day. We agreed to talk the following day. All right, buddy. All right, man. Take it easy. Bye. 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 Next time on Pretend... We're going to talk about some of Michael Torres' finds, and I'm going to try to fact check some of his wild claims. All right, you just listened to The Treasure Hunter, part one. There's a part two, part three, and part four. This story goes down some rabbit holes that are a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the series. I will link to the episodes in the show notes. And of course, I'm taking a little bit of a break working on the new season. So please bear with me. We'll be back real soon. In the meantime, if you haven't listened to Ponzi Playbook, that's a good, that's a good way to pass some time. And we are working on Criminal Conduct Season 5. It should be out hopefully this month if I could get my act together. Anyway, talk to you soon. Creative Babble.